We are discussing the foundations of nursing theory and its application to professional nursing practice. I am so delighted that you chose to take this theory class with me. We are going to have a wonderful eight weeks filled with vibrant discoveries about nursing. Let's talk about the components of nursing science and what helps develop nursing science. Theory, research, and, ed and education have a bi-directional flow influencing each other. Theory stimulates practitioners to do research, to learn new things, to test theory. As revelations are learned, that impacts what students are taught in the classroom about nursing. Subsequently, as students become more engaged and interested in advancing their knowledge, they themselves pose research and practice questions that stimulates further research and help define theory in an additional manner. So you can see how these concepts flow back and forth and then feed nursing science in its development. The science of nursing, or what we know about nursing, influences practice. Most of us became nurses but because we wanted to make a difference at the bedside with the patient and the family frontline nursing practice. But what gives shape to our practice and form and substance is the science behind it. Let's talk a little bit about Florence Nightingale. Now I won't belabor the point of her life because there are extensive resources on PAL that I hope you will explore and there is a discussion board question related to those readings. So I'm just going to hit the highlights about her life. Florence Nightingale was born into an extraordinarily wealthy family with a very progressive father who had advanced ideas about the education of women considering the time that she was born. She used all that advanced knowledge and became really the mother of modern nursing. She acted as an epidemiologist and a statistician and kept detailed recordings of her observations of nursing care, what worked, what didn't, and the patient outcomes. So she was really doing early research and keeping data on all of her findings. I hope you enjoy these photographs that I found on the internet of classic nursing uniforms. I think it gives us a peek into the people who paved the way for our practice today. In the 20s and the 30s, the type of nursing education that was most predominant were hospital training schools. And these started kind of popping up all over the United States. These really don't exist anymore. But each school had a nurse's dormitory where the nurses lived and they studied and practiced at the particular hospital where the school was housed. And these nurses, according to the internet, are circa 1920. In the 40s and 50s, nursing research began to generate scientific knowledge for nursing practice. We started to have scientific basis for different interventions and not, oh, this is the way it's always been done. The journal Nursing Research were, was first published during this era. And the nurses in this picture are circa 1949. Now, the early nursing theorists really advanced more of a philosophy of nursing, and they emphasized the person in both the patient and the nurse. This very humanistic approach to nursing really paralleled a lot of the humanistic psychology that was emerging post-Freudian era. Uh, subsequent to that, the grand theorists uh, became prevalent. Uh, theorists like Roy, Newman, King, and Oram were going to be studying all these 
uh, really groundbreaking nurse theorists in future weeks. The focus shift with these theorists from what nurses do to what nursing is. In the 60s and the 70s, uh, there was another shift from research to theory development. And the publication of these theories became more prevalent. And um, this helped shape how nursing was conceptualized. And this particular nurse is circa 19. 67. In the 80s and 90s, we see a shift away from the all-white capped nurse uh, to scrubs. There was also an advancement in scholarship and nursing literature regarding theory development. And the middle range theories began to evolve. Uh, more focused theories, we'll discuss that uh, as we go along in the term. And the nursing meta paradigm was conceptualized. And the nurses in this photograph were circa 1994. In the 2000s, we saw more men entering nursing. We also saw the expansion of relationship and caring theories, such as Duffy, Watson, and Kolkaba. There was more empirical study and evaluation of these theories in the literature. Now let's go over some basic terminology. What is a philosophy? A philosophy is a set of beliefs and values that define a way of thinking. They're generally known and understood by the group. So. Say, for instance, you gather a group of nurses together from all over the country, Georgia, Alaska, Hawaii, Texas, it doesn't matter where. These group, this group of nurses are going to have fairly similar ideas, values and beliefs, or philosophy about things like sanctity of human life, uh, caring, honoring people's values and culture, in patient care, etc., etc. If we were a group of SWAT team officers, or Navy SEALs, or electrical engineers, or firemen, we would have a different philosophy about our discipline, a different set of beliefs and values that would define the way we think and drive our, our the way we practice our discipline or profession. A paradigm is a world view or a widely accepted value system. It's also a network of theory, research, education, and practice within a given discipline. You may have heard people say, oh, I had a paradigm shift, a, way, a different way of thinking. An example of that might be if you go to the bank and encounter a very grumpy teller and you walk away thinking, oh, this teller was the most obnoxious, grumpy person. But then later on, you learned that their son had a terminal diagnosis, their spouse walked out on them. Something devastating happened that changed the way you viewed this person. That's a paradigm shift. So there are paradigms within nursing as well. This is a diagram of how things all fit together from the most broad to the most specific. So the nursing meta paradigm is a global overview, almost like an umbrella over all the theories. And each theory, no matter whether it's grand, mid-range, or practice, have elements of the nursing meta paradigm. Grand theories are less focused than the nursing meta paradigm, but more focused, or more broad, excuse me, than the mid-range theories. And as you get on down to the point of this triangle, practice theories are the most specific, but the most narrow. So what exactly is the nursing meta paradigm? It is comprised of four components. The nurse, or nursing, person, environment, and health. 
So let's go back to the nurse. This is actually the helping process, that interpersonal interaction that creates health and wholeness, the part of nursing that sometimes is not quantifiable, is more relational. Um, the exchange that you might have with somebody, maybe just a hand holding or a wiping someone's tear or, or um, that kind of interaction. Person relates to the human being, both to the nurse and to the person who's being cared for, and it's multidimensional. Think about all the components that make up a person. Physical, emotional, psychological, social, economic, educational, all those components that are unique to a particular person. Environment comprises the boundaries around that person, the physical space in that environment that the person dwells, the spiritual environment, the cultural environment. And health refers to the goal of nursing, which, of course, we all know from our basic nursing uh, education is holistic in nature. A grand theory is broad in scope, very complex, but also abstract and not testable. Whereas a middle range theory or a mid range theory is more narrow in scope, scope and can be empirically tested. Let's look at some additional terminology. What are assumptions? Assumptions are givens, things that are presumed to be true and not tested. We have an assumption about nurses, that they are caring professional people. That is pretty much a given across our culture and across really the world, that a nurse is this type of individual. An example might be as an assumption that death is a transition. Therefore, death is the end of a life. We have propositions, which are theoretical statements that prescribe, excuse me, describe, explain, and predict relationships between concepts. So let's talk about how knowledge is developed. Knowledge is developed in two ways, inductive, and deductively. Let's talk about inductive. Inductive process goes from the specific to the general. Particular instances are observed to be consistently part of a whole or a set and we create patterns from those observations. Let's just take for existence we observe patients over time who develop decubitus ulcers. We look at each individual patient and describe their condition, whether it's a cachectic condition or prolonged bed rest, and then we make general assumptions about decubitus ulcers and their formation from specific patient encounters. A exa further example might be a laparotomy is a painful surgery. A tendon repair is a painful surgery. A cabbage is a painful surgery. Therefore, all of surgery is painful. We took the specifics and made a generalization. The other way is deductive process. We start with the general and move to the specific. We identify particular instances within a broad premise and then look at individual or specific trends or patterns from multiple observations. An example of detective reasoning might be all surgical procedures are painful. An appendectomy is a surgical procedure, therefore an appendectomy is painful. Let's look at the flow of theory, outcomes, and practice. Theory through deduction, we, using theory, we deduce certain interventions that are effective or not effective 
and that influences our outcomes. Our practice then, given those certain outcomes, changes as we learn what produces better patient outcomes or not so much better patient outcomes. This also fosters new insights into, gee, what might even produce a better patient outcome. Then inductively that flows back up to theory and shaping theory based on practice and insights. So you might be thinking, who really cares about this? This is not relevant to my practice at all. I don't see any point in learning all these different theories. Well, let me challenge you to think a little bit differently because theory can give shape and form and foundation to your practice. It can assist the practicing nurse to organize, understand, and analyze patient data, make decisions on planning care, predict outcomes of care, evaluate those outcomes, and clarify concepts for use as tools of practice. If one were to examine a theory, and you're going to have lots of opportunity to do that in the upcoming weeks, one would think about a variety of components. So let's go through and look at those one by one. In examining a theory, you might ask, what is the purpose of this theory? In what context or setting is the theory applied? Is the focus on the nurse, person, environment, or health? And I hope you notice the components of the nursing meta paradigm in nurse, person, environment, and health. So what is the purpose? Let's just look at a theory that we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come, Madeline Leininger's culture care theory. The purpose of that theory was to honor cultural differences among patients. So that might be um, something that would impact the person and the environment and obviously the outcome or health of the patient. If you're examining theory, you might want to look at the major concepts. Are the concepts predominantly abstract? Are they really hard to understand like some of Martha Rogers' concepts? Are they pretty concrete and basic and easy to understand? Are the concepts conceptually and operationally defined? And what I mean by that is, are they observable and measurable? What is the nature of the relationships? concepts to assumptions to propositions of the particular theory. Are the relationships directional? Do they have a flow to them? Like we'll look at Patricia Benner's novice to expert model in a minute. Those relationships are directional. Are the links between the concepts clear? Do the relationships describe, explain, or predict something, some particular phenomena like pain or comfort? Are the relationships illustrated in a diagram? What are the assumptions that underline the theory? And every theory has assumptions. And when we do case studies later on in the term, I'm going to be challenging you to pull out those assumptions and apply it to the written case study. Are the assumptions explicit? Are they very clear and easy to understand? Or are they more implicit, implied? What assumptions address the nursing meta paradigm? Are the what are the values held by the theorist? And can these assumptions be measured or verified through experience? So let's look at these two models because they are very different, yet they have common features. Through each model, you can deduce or infer what the theorist is trying to express, some assumptions and values. Let's look at Benner's novice to expert. You can see that within the clinical context, there are five levels 
of nursing practice. And if you notice that they are hierarchical, the novice is at the bottom and the expert is at the top. If you notice that the novice break base is very broad, indicating that there are lots of novices, less advanced beginners, less competent nurses, and so on and so forth. Let's look by contrast to Leininger's Sunrise Enabler that de depicts the culture care theory. This is a much more complex model than Benner's model, which is pretty easy to understand. You have to look at Leininger's model quite some time to figure out her culture care theory. And you can see that this is not directional and not hierarchical, but the different components or factors of the model impact each other. How clear is the theory? How many concepts are there? Benner's theory was pretty clear in that there were five major concepts or steps in becoming an expert from a novice. Are the significant concepts defined in understandable language or is it pretty hard to understand what the theorist is trying to explain? Are the concepts used in a manner consistent with their definition? Is the diagram understandable like Benner and consistent with the explanation? And how many relationships are there in the concepts, i.e. are they hierarchical and directional? You can see from, or you can recall from the Leininger, um, let's go back, the Leininger model that there are quite a number of concepts all interrelated and they are much more complex and difficult to understand than the Benner model on the left. How empiric is the theory? Can the concepts be measured and the relationships tested? Can the theory be used to guide research, practice, and education? How well does the theory generate ideas among practitioners to think about further research or practice changes or educational impact? How general is the theory? Can it be applied in a variety of patient settings and populations or is it specific to just one type of patient or one type of setting? Does it generate hypotheses about universal behaviors, such as adult learning theory? Does it ex address a specific phenomena like pain or comfort? So we are going back to the slide that we started with. Hopefully you have a little better understanding of the bi-directional flow between theory, research, and education, funneling down to nursing science, and I hope you see highlighted in red because I wanted you to really focus on that is that I really truly believe that theory can impact practice in a positive way. It gives again shape, form, and substance to your practice. I look forward to a vibrant eight weeks with you and I will see you in class and see you on the discussion board.